Blog Talk Radio. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. All right, everybody, this is Brother Frank, and glad to be here with you uh, on another exciting episode of The Remnant Call. And, uh, folks, these are uh, indeed uh, important times that we are living in. God is calling us as believers uh, to be more than conquerors. So if right now you are in a spirit of fear and panic, that is not from God. God is calling us to something greater, uh, something more important. He is calling us to be witnesses in this hour. But the truth is that we are not to enter into this time in our own flesh. We are to enter into this hour uh, knowing that God promised to never leave us nor forsake us. Well, folks, I have a guest back on tonight by special uh, request by many of you and also uh, is family to this show, and that is Brother Benjamin, and uh, he is on with us right now, and I'm going to bring him in. Brother, God bless you. Glad to have you back on. Uh, Benjamin, I don't know if you got to hear last night, we had the Johnson family uh, on the Remnant call, um, was just uh, excited. I know you've been a big supporter of the Johnson family. Um, they have been a blessing to, I think, everybody that just knows them. And um, so uh, the, the title of last night's program was, um, When Should You Leave? And uh, I think that my, inf- my, my personal um, thoughts on that was the same thoughts, the things that you've been talking about for years. We should leave exactly when God tells us to. And I don't believe that's ever changed. Not once. And uh, so... Folks, if you didn't hear that with the Johnson family, please go on there uh, and check that out from last night. Well, tonight's program with Brother Benjamin here is a follow-up to two weeks ago, the Days of Awe. And we are truly, folks, entering into the Days of Awe. And so I'm going to open with a word of prayer, and we're going to turn it over to Benjamin um, to talk about tonight's topic, Prepare Yourselves, because, folks, it's here, it's time we need to prepare. Let's pray. Father, in the name above every name, Yeshua Jesus, we ask that what comes out on this show tonight, Lord, would be according to your will and not our own. I ask, Father, in the holy name of Yeshua, that you would bless us to, Lord, see what you desire for us to do at this moment. I thank you, Lord, that you have blessed the remnant call to grow Lord, to reach your believers around the world. And Lord, I pray now at this time, after years of warning, that we would take it seriously in our preparation because the day of the Lord is truly at hand, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brother Benjamin, thank you for being back on. When you're not on for a while, people get nervous. They're like, where's Benjamin at? (laughs) So, (laughs) well, (laughs) God bless you, brother. And um, yeah, I'm... Praise God. I want to thank whoever started praying for me about 30 minutes ago, if you're listening. God bless you. Um, today was like a day without prayer, Frank. Mm, that's not good. Yeah, no. No, because there's, you know, every day has its own evil thereof. You know, the enemy always shows up. But... Um, people of God, we, we don't always show up. And, you know, today just felt like a day without prayer. I mean, it was a desolate time. You know, maybe it was just sort of a foreboding of what lies ahead for many of us. And, you know, we need to take advantage of the time that remains to prepare ourselves and the normalcy bias continues. 
know, the astonishing thing, Frank, about the normalcy bias, you know, which is the the belief system, the worldview, the the attitude that everything's going to be fine and it's all going to go back to normal um, someday soon, and that nothing bad's ever going to happen to me. That normalcy bias is a deception. It's always been a deception. You know, human history is marred with with interventions, with events that changed the course of history and, and changed the lives and the destinies of, of vast numbers of people on the planet. So the normalcy bias has always been a bit of a lie. And um, especially in this hour, when normal is pretty far gone, wouldn't you say, Frank, that normal sort of left the room? Uh, yeah, the but it's amazing... Year? It's amazing, though, how many people believe that it will go on, and if Trump wins, everything will be just fine. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a religion I just can't grasp because, you know, the Democrats have already tipped their hand that in the event of a Trump victory, and if we get as far as an election in November, the real poll results are showing a massive landslide uh, and a massive Trump victory. But that's only on election night, and the Democrats have already told us they're going to keep finding new mail-in votes in the following weeks and months after the election until they found enough votes to declare Biden the victory or to declare the election no contest, no final result will be entered in under the Constitution um, but by a point in time in the spring following the November election, if when it's time for the uh, final certification, you know, and this is apparently somewhere after the inauguration date that's scheduled for normally in January, if we don't have a certified winner, then the House of Representatives votes to elect the president. And so you'll be looking at President Pelosi by March. But none of that I, I really don't think is even going to matter because I think the Lord is going to intervene and I think the judgment is about to come. And, uh, you know, I was I was going to share just briefly on um, a scripture in John chapter 8 and um, uh, a brother by the name of Tim Foster um, got this insight into the scriptures and i thought it was profound and so i I just want to share on it just for a moment here um in john 7 the lord went to the feast of tabernacles he went to the fall feast he appeared in in jerusalem he appeared at the temple teaching he stood up and said if anyone thirst let them come unto me for living water and the the people all went home to their own houses. And after the feast, after the Feast of Tabernacles was over, the next day at sunrise, at dawn, the Lord got up early and he went to the temple. And that was the morning that they found the woman in adultery. And the, the Pharisees confronted Jesus with the, the challenge, you know, the Mosaic law says we stone this woman. What do you say? You know, would, and would Jesus respect and honor the law and permit them to basically execute this woman? Or what would he do? And they thought they had the Lord cornered, and of course the Lord, he lifts himself up, and he says unto them, You that are without sin, let the one without sin cast the first stone. And then he began writing the sins of the men in the sand. And the oldest to the youngest began to just depart and leaving the the condemned woman alone with the Lord. And Brother Tim's insight, and this one, I found this so amazing. This was the day after the completion of the Feast of Tabernacles. And the Lord was saying, let the one without sin throw the first stone. And I thought of Pastor Dana's dream of October where he saw a 
stone thrown from heaven. The Lord being the one without sin, casting the stone after tabernacles, which conclude on October 10. So is this the stone cut without hands that will strike the image of Mystery Babylon in the feet? And will the stone be thrown on October 11th? Will that be the event that causes all of our government leaders' heads to explode, blowing their mind? Because nobody expects the judgment of God in four weeks, or actually technically a month from today. You know, perhaps... And maybe not. Maybe there's a, a brief window. But I think if you just look at everything happening in our land, the judgment's already begun. I mean, anyone that thinks that this is normal, uh, it's, it's absolutely absurd what is happening to us. And, um, it is astonishing how there are so many, you know, so many lies being sold to the American people as, uh, as the truth. Um, some of our audience is no doubt familiar with Martin Armstrong. This is a, a, actually a secular think tank guy who, who has developed software to analyze trends in, in, in our current world. He basically came out and said the entire COVID pandemic is a hoax. Yes, there's a real virus. Yes, people are getting sick. Yes, it's a new and improved version of the flu. And, and yes, if you have comorbidity factors or you have diabetes or if you're you know, over the age of 70, yes, it could be very, very dangerous for you. But the death rate is no more than the flu, and the elite are using it to transform fundamentally the entire world. They are using this crisis which was sprung on the world at this time in order to bring in what they call the Great Reset, which will be the elimination of the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency, which will result in a massive economic collapse, not only here in the U.S., but worldwide, blamed on America, but it will also result in massive loss of purchasing power for our country. It will push this nation into poverty. It will collapse our current institutions, and it will allow the, the ruling elite to push the world towards their new world order in which they propose to impose a green new deal, which means you don't get to drive your car, you don't get to heat your house, and you don't get to enjoy the standard of living. Now, the standard of living that you're accustomed to, well, Frank, this is going to result in billions of very unhappy people. And so a major war is also planned to um, facilitate the adjustment. The world will find it easier to adjust to the new satanic slavery system that the elite Im plan to impose on us if the transition to get us there involves a world war on top of a global financial collapse and the end of our industrial economy and the beginning of a return to the feudal slavery system of the Dark Ages, which is really what the New World Order will look like to the slave population. And that's what's ahead of us, folks. The Bible calls it the Great Tribulation. The time of the heathen. The reign of the Antichrist. The Laodiceans were told they're all going to disappear any day now. Hope that works out for them. Those who know the scriptures realize the dead in Christ are raised first. And we that remain will be caught up to be with the Lord in the sky. We'll meet him in the clouds on the way to Jerusalem. And he raises the dead on the last day. He said so himself. I will raise them up on the last day. So unless the Lord has a problem with counting, we're all staying. Unless we leave as martyrs or as a result of the terrible things that are about to engulf our earth. And it certainly appears, Frank, that the 70th year of Babylon indeed has come. 
a good friend of mine, John Haller, he's like, well, 2020 is sure stacking up to look like the 70th year. And it's not slowing down. But I thank God that what is ahead for the remnant is a time of Teshuvah, a time of returning to the Lord, a time of repentance, a time of restoration. The day of redemption is coming for the remnant of God. And we have a part in preparing for it. And that part is what we're going to talk about tonight, our preparations. And, you know, to, to prepare for the day of the Lord, the Scripture is very clear on what you need to do. And God does not mention buying guns. He doesn't mention accumulating gold. He doesn't talk about stockpiling toilet paper or, you know, freeze-dried foods or any of that stuff. And I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't do any preparation in the natural. But that's all secondary to the preparations that the Lord is calling for among his people. Those preparations are strictly in the matters of the heart, and they are strictly in the things that pertain to the Spirit and to the cleansing of our lives from all of the defilements that have overcome our nation, overcome the church, that have overcome our own generational bloodlines, and that have tainted our own lives as well. And those defilements have been pres- they've been thrown at us through every medium. The television commercials. You know, if you haven't turned off your television, maybe you ought to pray about it. And you know, if you haven't come out from among them, you ought to think about it. But but even after you turn off the TV, even after you burn all the satanic m- music or you destroy it rebuke it, cast it out of your life, even after you put down the unclean things, there yet remains a sanctification process that we have got to walk through. And the Lord instructs us on how to get ready, and he calls that process a solemn assembly. You know, the formal organizational structure that God is is literally commanding of his people now, is a time of fasting and prayer and a solemn assemblies. And that's exactly what these high holy days that are coming upon us are all about. For those who understand or have studied the high holy days of Israel or the high holy days of the Bible, and you know, um, because they're really the Lord's holy days, and you know, they, they truly are the holy days of Israel because Jesus is the king of Israel, and um, his kingdom's name is, is the kingdom of Israel. And if, if you're a Gentile and you're born again, um, you actually have been grafted into a new nation. <laughs> and you're, you're a member of the commonwealth of Israel. And Israel means ruled by God. And the citizens of this great nation are all under the rule of their God, who is also the king of Israel. And his name is Jesus. And he's a good Lord. And he's a very good king. And we've all got to get into alignment under his authority now. And that is what the preparing of our hearts and our lives is all about. And so, for that reason, every year, as we approach the fall feast days, They are preceded by the month of Elul, which is the 30 days before the month of Tishri. And the month of Elul is actually the month of repentance, a 30-day period of time for the people to begin the process of examining their hearts, begin the process of searching the deep things for the, the weighty matters that we have got to address in prayer and in repentance. And those 30 days lead us to the day of trumpets, Yom Torah, which in the secular world is known as Rosh Hashanah. And it's the first day of Tishri. And the trumpets are 
sounded to warn the people, the final ten days have begun. And what is coming is the Day of Atonement. And this is the day where all the nation is commanded to fast and pray. Fasting and prayer during a lull and fasting and prayer during the ten days of awe is optional. Although in today's world, rapidly racing towards the edge of the abyss, it's probably advisable that we all be fasting and praying on some basis right now. But on the day of Yom Kippur, fasting and prayer is commanded by the Lord. And so we are hoping to provide a forum to help you. You know, Frank and I have been talking and and uh, we've had a couple of conversations and we've been praying about what do we do, Lord? And we really got the guidance from the Holy Spirit that we were to have a solemn assembly on the remnant call, which is really a, kind of a radical idea. I mean, I know we've never done a solemn assembly on a virtual format. And uh, Frank, you can address the the technical internet technical parts of what we're going to be doing. But but I just want to you know capture the vision of of how this came to pass. You know, as we were seeking the, the face of God, um, I really felt that there are so many who are listening to Remnant Call. You're listening to some of the different um, teachers or, or watchmen that are out there and maybe you don't have a local church, or if you do, your your local church is still on the potluck page, and not the not the fasting and prayer page during the song, during the high holy days, you know. And and maybe you don't have people to pray with. Maybe you don't have people that would even gather with you in a solemn assembly, and yet you you passionately passionately you earnestly desire to be part of one. Well, five years ago. In prayer, uh, the Lord impressed upon me to, to organize a solemn assembly in northern Idaho. And I called my friend Michael Snyder, and I asked him if he would help sponsor, organize, and advertise it. And Michael did. And, uh, and we had a solemn assembly in Sandpoint, Idaho, over the weekend that began with... Uh, the Feast of Trumpets on Friday night, September 18th. And here we are five years later, and the Feast of Trumpets falls on exactly the same night, September 18th. Only this time we're going to be doing a solemn assembly um, over the Internet. And a solemn assembly is uh, really the message of the prophet Joel, where he cried out to the nation and he and in Joel chapter 1, verse 14, the prophet declared, Sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord, and cry unto the Lord. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and its destruction from the Almighty it shall come. And so, on you know, the prophecies in the book of Joel, and there's, there's only three chapters, so you can read it for yourself, they're clearly directed to the nation of people that are witnessing the events of the last days coming to pass right before their eyes, and the instructions from heaven are to sanctify a fast and gather together in solemn assemblies and to cry out to the Lord. Now, sanctifying a fast is speaking of fasting from food. It's speaking of fasting from pleasant food either in the form of a Daniel fast, or a, a juice fast, or a water fast, or on Yom Kippur, many of us fast on the actual Day of Atonement from both food and water. Sundown to sundown, nothing. And the purpose of the fast is to put down the flesh. You know, fasting from TV, fasting from your favorite video game, Fasting from donuts. Okay, children, you know, 
I mean, you're pretending. Those are those are pretend. Those are baby fast for children. You know, and if that's if that's what you got, bring it. But um, if you're going to actually gather in solemn assemblies, um, and and I would encourage everyone that's listening, if you're going to approach the ten days of awe with the same seriousness that that we are approaching it, reach out to family, to friends, to to people that are on the same page. And if they're willing to, to meet with you in person, you guys can have solemn assembly meetings during the 10 days. Uh, Frank and, uh, and I will be opening the Days of Awe on Friday night, September 18, with a solemn assembly that will be on, basically live on the Internet. And y- you all can participate and in, in be part of it in terms of listening and praying with us. We are not going to be able to open the prayer lines for everybody to actually participate in that sense, but we hope to have uh, several people that will be the assembly of those that are praying, and and we will be praying prayers of repentance for our own sin, for the sins of our, of our community, for the sins of our families, the generational sins in our bloodlines, for the sins of our church, for the sins of our of our brothers and sisters, and ultimately for the sins of our nation. And we are going to cry out to God for mercy, and we are going to humble ourselves, and we are going to repent, and we're going to weep, and we're going to ask for mercy. And if you read the book of Joel, the Lord basically says, if you do this, and if you humble yourself, and if you afflict yourself with this fasting, and if you turn and seek him with all of your heart, he will hear from heaven, and he will bless your land. And at this point in time, we desperately need God's blessing on our families, in our homes, in our, in our own hearts. And so we wanted to facilitate the days of all by providing a forum and a, an example of how a solemn assembly can be done. Now, we're not under the law of the knowledge of good and evil. We're not under the, the law of men's interpretations. You're under the law of the Spirit of God to do as the Lord would direct to you. But if you feel so led to participate and to join us in our virtual solemn assembly on the night of September 18. And we're going to meet again on Sunday night, September 27, which is the evening and the beginning of Yom Kippur. And we're going to bookend the Days of Awe at the beginning and at the end with two virtual solemn assemblies in which our hope and our vision is to equip and to encourage you in the deep repentance prayers that are absolutely necessary to break the satanic yokes and the deceptions, and the strongholds, and to destroy all the works of the devil off of your life and the lives of your family members and the lives of the people that you're interceding and standing in the gap for, and to prepare a people who will be ready to stand when the day of the Lord begins. Amen. Uh, Benjamin, I wanted to just really quick here talk to the people about this. Um, so folks, what we're going to do is we are going to do this over Zoom and uh, there's not going to be, you know, we're not going to have a big live audio feed because uh, Benjamin lives in a place where he has to use satellite. That's not going to work. But with Zoom, you can call in or you can come across the internet either way. Uh, the important part is the audio piece will be on there. Everybody can hear and uh, what, so that way uh, you can listen either way. And I will put the link out next Thursday and we'll send and the remnant call and uh, on how everybody can get to it. And uh, you will be able to talk or join in and be able to listen from your own home. I will have some of my friends here with me. Um, there's some other people that we may have joining in uh, from another place and Benjamin and, 
and potentially some other, maybe whoever with him and other people uh, listening in. And, and like I said, folks, we, I talked about this on the days of all. The reason we can't open it up for everybody to pray is because, unfortunately, with all the many God-fearing believers that listen to this program, there are also enemies that listen to this show. And when we open up just for anybody to get in there, folks, what comes out of people's mouths sometimes, it, this is not the time for it. It's not the place. This is grown up. This is, this is meat. This is not milk. We're not playing around. This is serious stuff. So you can't just open up the, the, you know, for everybody to pray. Uh, I'm sorry. I wish we could, but we live in a crazy world. And if you could even see the emails and the things Benjamin and I get, um, you would want to jump off a cliff because you realize people are crazy out there. And we do not want to open this m- platform up to give Satan a seat at the table. But you will be able to be there, um, be a part of this. We'll be praying uh, with you. You can you know, email in prayer requests, things like that, to, rem- to uh, frank at remnantcall.com, uh, and, we'll, you know, and, and things like that, and we'll pray over them. Uh, we're going to seek the Lord. And, and, folks, there is nothing special about whether you can be at somebody's home here with us that you're on it. It doesn't matter. It's wherever you're at. Even if you can't get uh, uh, called in or something, the fact that you are joining with us in prayer, in seeking the Lord, and in repentance. I have friends that are coming here. We're going to talk about some things that's not going to be on the air because it's time to drill down deep. It's time to hit some hard stuff. And it's going to be deep. Uh, but you know what? We're going to start it. And, and so the plan is... From the Saturday, or excuse me, Friday night, the 18th, we will begin the fast at sundown, uh, wherever we are. Uh, I guess if you're several time zones behind, I'm on East Coast. Um, we'll be at the normal remnant call. Uh, we'll, we'll announce what time we'll start. You may want to start a little before sundown um, so you can join in with us. And we will fast all the way through till the day of Yom Kippur and the end of Yom Kippur at sundown. And like Benjamin said, there's different ways to fast. Now, I, I would encourage you to try a water fast. We have talked about many times on this program, there's a mixture where you can take distilled water, uh, put it into a gallon jug, and put in, cut up some carrots and beets and celery. You can add a little mint in there. Uh, if you are low on energy, you can add a little bit of, uh, of uh, honey in there if you need to, if you're getting really weak. I have to work through a lot of this, except for I will take off for Yom Kippur for sure. And, um, but I will have times when I will have some weakness. And I may have to have some liquid that has something to give me a little bit of, uh, of, of uh, you know, energy back. But I'm going to stick with that because, folks, like Benjamin and I have talked about, this is the time. And, and, and don't believe, I know a 10-day fast, that sounds insane. But once you hit the fourth day and your hunger leaves, and sometimes it happens on the third day. But usually by the fourth day at least. And you're going to start seeing and feeling, and, and your relationship is going to change. And if you've never fasted that long, there's something that happens, and I can't explain it to you. And I don't know how to say this any different, but you will feel less sinful. And maybe you don't feel mm-hmm. sinful right now. But when you hit that point, you'll understand what, what I'm talking about. And go ahead and feel free to shoot me an email, because it's an amazing feeling. Benjamin, you know what I'm talking about. When you hit that third, fourth day out, that well, feeling that absolutely. comes over you. Yeah, and just to just to clarify, the um, distilled water with the vegetables is providing electrolytes, um, the organic salts, and minerals that are leaching out of these vegetables into the distilled water, and it keeps your blood chemistry balanced. You're not getting Amen. any carbs or protein, so you are absolutely on a total water fast. You cannot do extraneous physical work if you're fasting like that. And the honey, you don't add it to that mixture. You take a tablespoon or, pardon me, a teaspoon of honey um, as needed with each 8-ounce glass of the liquid. And you can drink as many of them as you want. And the mixture is three parts um, carrot, two parts 
beet, one part celery, and you know, best to use organic. You don't want pesticides leaching into this water. And yeah, we're going to fast for 10 days. Now, if you've never fasted before and you can't do that, then do what you can do. And if you decide, I'm going to fast for the 10 days, and you make it as far as the evening of day one and you break the fast, then the next day start it again. And don't come under condemnation. And if you have to eat one meal a day or you need to do a Daniel fast or whatever you need to do, be free to do it. But do something. And and don't be condemned. If you need to eat a meal every two or three days, that works too, guys. The advantage of the continuous fast using the distilled water is that around day four, your body goes into ketosis. And somewhere between day five and six, your body begins detoxing massively. You must Eat healthy the three or four days prior to the fast. You do not go out eat junk food. You, you eat a lot of roughage, a lot of vegetables, fruits, and nuts. And you absolutely eat, do some kind of fiber drink to completely cleanse your colon if you're going to do the fast beyond three days. But so the purpose of the fasting is to put down the flesh, and the flesh loses its power. It loses its ability to dominate you. I mean, most of us are dominated by our bellies. I mean, the one thing we all find time to do every day is eat. And it's actually the top priority. You know, and and if you think about it, how many churches have you ever attended where the pastor stood up and said, this weekend we're going to sanctify a fast and have a solemn assembly? I've never seen it. I stood up in in a local church and and preached that we needed everybody fasting, that we all need to repent of the sin of gluttony. And if you're an American, you're a glutton, because every one of us overate on Thanksgiving. This is a country of overeaters. It's a country that's really, you know, bound in in addiction to food. You know, the food is... uh, church crack and instead of solemn assemblies these churches are still calling for potluck yeah and you know that's their business Uh, benjamin one thing i wanted to mention that's folks this is very important and i can't stress this enough um benjamin was talking about if you have to eat a meal every uh so often but listen if you go two days out to three i'm gonna tell you i'm gonna warn you right now do not eat very much. Now, if you go long term, you're going to do this whole thing. You even go three, four days. The recommendation for coming back into eating food is to take the amount of days you've been fasting to ease your way back into eating. So when you go long term fast and you go 10 days, the first day you come back, you're, going to, you're not going to want to sit down and eat solid food. You're going to begin with something very light to get bacteria to begin coming back into your body. Uh, and then you're going to, the next day, you may eat you know, something, maybe even a little bit of, of yogurt, something with some prebiotics. You don't have to go dairy, but I'm saying something with some probiotics in it to begin to grow that bacteria again. And, and you will ease back into it. And I'll re-put the links back up to the uh, Benjamin, you, uh, the the doctor from South America, uh, we had the links on a former show. I'll repost them again. Folks, I cannot stress to you the, enough. The book's off the Internet. The book is, it is no longer on the Internet. Okay. Well, I think I uploaded maybe the PDF, so we may be oh, okay. Great. Great. So, um, but, but, folks, I cannot stress to you the dangers of all of a sudden eating at once when you've been fasting. You will, first of all, ruin your entire fast, and you will have some severe stomach pain. So you need to just ease yourself back in. You should not, if you fast 10 days, you should be at least eight to 10 days, you know, seven at least to eight days before you start, even out to 10, before you fully start eating like you normally did before. That is the rule of thumb in fasting long term. You will, it will just allow your fast to take its full course at a natural rate. You'll come back in and uh, it'll be a wonderful thing. And and don't worry, you know, like it's easy to break yourself back in because you're going to experience something so wonderful 
that I cannot explain it until you've done it. You have to experience it, and you'll understand what we've been talking about. It's not that you are going to do something magical that makes God's hand move. That has nothing to do at all. But when God sees the heart of his children crying out, he is so merciful. I think we often forget how merciful he is. He doesn't see his children cry and just turn a blind eye. No, the, fa- the, 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 the prodigal son was the picture of the Heavenly Father. When he saw that child coming home in disaster and broken, it says he went running. That's our God. And so, folks, I just wanted to stress that. Benjamin, back to you, brother. Yeah, um, the transition off the fast, um, not super critical if you only fast for a couple of days. It's wisdom to, to, you know, have a light salad, have some oatmeal, eat an orange, cut up a few pieces of apple, trans, you know, slowly come back. If you fast 10 days or longer, very critical that you pay very close attention to how you come off the fast and, and do so very cautiously. You get out past 17 days, you could kill yourself. People have died by breaking the fast incorrectly and by eating way too much food. Um, so it's really a function of how long. If, you've only, if you're only fasting one, two, or three days, um, it's not the super important, you know, medically critical that you be very, very careful. But you don't break the fast by going to McDonald's, and you don't break the fast by ordering a steak. It's eat, eat light and easily digestible food. But you know, back to the solemn assembly, uh, we're trying to open and, and, and bookmark these days that God ordained for the repentance and, and for the fasting and for the prayers of the nation. And so we're trying to provide um, a a forum in which you can come in agreement in prayer with us. And folks, we're going to repent of everything, repent of everything that that our country did, everything that was done in our communities, everything that was done in the bloodlines of our families, and everything we've done. And so we're going to cover all of it. And you'll be able to enter into agreement with our repentance prayers for the country, for the communities, for your church, for your family, and for your own life as well. And and then, you know, it's our vision that um, to the extent you've got a prayer partner, to the extent you've got people you can get together with, if you feel comfortable praying with other people, um, get together during the 10 days and do solemn assemblies in person as you're able. And now I've had a few people contact me regarding... Um, Psalm Assemblies up in northern Idaho, um, and we may be organizing something like that. So, you know, if you're interested in attending in person, uh, you could send me an email. We probably will, if we do uh, in-person assemblies during those 10 days, um, it would likely be in the city of Coeur d'Alene, and it very likely might be the final weekend, which would culminate in the Sunday night Yom Kippur uh, service, but I, I'm open to in-person uh, meetings of small groups, assuming enough people want to come. And so I'll just leave it at that. Um, I'm excited. You know, these days of all, this is an important time for us to prepare ourselves for the coming day of the Lord. And you know, the I think the fasting does more than just show God we're serious. I think it actually turns the lights out on the mind of the flesh. Because all of your strength in the flesh just dissipates. And, you know, that old nature, that old nature loses its grip, its dominance over your life. And it's like the spirit becomes empowered. And it's just so much easier to enter into the anointing. It is so much easier to break through into the presence of God. It is so much easier to pray in the power of the Holy Spirit while you're in the process of fasting. And it's the reason why God commands fasting. 
You know, these are not suggestions. These are the commandments of the Lord. Now, mo- it's, as surprising as it may be, the majority of Christians have never attended a solemn assembly. A lot of Christians have never even heard of such a thing. Apparently they don't read their Bibles very carefully because the solemn days and the solemn assemblies are in the Scriptures, but most Christians are absolutely unaware of even what they are. Well, it's time we fix that. And it's time that all of us have had you know, the opportunity of participating in a solemn assembly. Now, solemn assemblies are meant to be serious. We don't need another church meeting, you guys. We don't need a retreat. We don't need to sit there and listen to some man preach from the knowledge of good and evil with a bunch of solical emotion designed to lift the emotions in the carnal hearts of the listeners, and everybody gets emotionally touched and motivated. Oh, yeah, praise God, let's go. And, and then everybody goes home, and the next day nothing has changed. Because it was all of the flesh. And the flesh profits nothing. We need the purpose of the solemn assembly. The purpose of the fasting and prayer is, number one, for us to humble ourselves, repent of our sins, call upon the name of the Lord, seek His face with all of our hearts, confess our sins one to another, and it doesn't have to be one to the group, and to turn from our wicked ways and to to return with all of our hearts in our commitment to the Lord. And in that place, to break through to the anointing that will break the yoke, because there's a lot of people bound up by Satan, and they don't even know it. And, uh, you know, those feelings of hopelessness, of depression, of, of, of frustration, of despair, of those strongholds of unforgiveness, those roots of bitterness, those are all the arsenal of the evil one. They're the veil that's cast over the minds of the people that keep us out of the place of walking in faith, hope, and love, from which we can maintain the presence of the Holy Spirit. You know, today, most Spirit-filled Christians who have been baptized in the Holy Spirit do not walk in the fullness of the anointing. Now, they may break through to the fullness of the anointing in their prayer time when they're in prayer of agreement with another anointed person, and that's the reason for the anointed and solemn assembly. But a lot of people are having trouble breaking through on their own. That's how much resistance is occurring right now in the Spirit. And for many, for most, I'll venture to say the majority, the anointing that is achieved in the breakthrough prayer time, in agreement with other anointed Christians, that anointing, I would, I'll use the word dissipates in the time shortly after our agreement in prayer has ended. And why is that? Do we have a leak? Is there an open door? Does the enemy still have stronghold ground? Are there things we haven't dealt with that is giving them a, a degree of an advantage? And when we gather in prayers of agreement with other anointed people. And I, I mean, I was praying with a beloved sister the other day. The power of God fell so mightily. And we definitely broke stuff in the Spirit. But, you know, by the end of the day, I wasn't in that powerful place of the Holy Spirit. Folks, we can get to the breakthrough to such an extent that you can stay in the anointing. It doesn't leave. When you gather with other believers and you pray and you enter in, in the power of God, it only grows. But as you walk through the rest of your day, it does not leave. And that's the place that we all really should be desiring. Now, is that achieved in one day? No. Now, the process of learning to abide in the presence of the Lord takes time in prayer, in worship, and, and in fasting, and in confessing our sins, and, and you know, doing the deep work 
of deep repentance. But it can be done. And in that place, you can walk through anything. In that place, you're not afraid of the things that are that cause the men of this world to be afraid because you're dwelling in the secret hiding place of the Most High God. Nothing's coming nigh unto your dwelling place. You will only look on and behold the judgment of the wicked. Ten thousand might fall at your side, but it will not come near unto you because you have made the Most High your dwelling place. Folks, that's a process of returning home. It's a process of humbling ourselves. You know, that spirit of pride is so prevalent. It's so hideous, really. You know, when you've been through the fire and your life has been purged in the fire, you look at pride and you just don't... It doesn't even make sense. You know, what are we... Why would we even be proud? I mean, what, what have you done? That you're, that you're solely responsible for, that would cause you even to think in these terms. But it's the deception of Satan. It's the first abomination. Go look it up in the book of Proverbs. Do a Bible study on abominations. You'll find pride is number one in the list. And yet, here we are. And the, the scripture is very clear. The Lord knows the proud from far off. So if we're walking in our pride, and yet we're born again, the Lord knows you from a distance. Well, we need to get that pride out of us. We need to get closer to the Lord. And we need to get every other sin confessed and dealt with, repented of. We need to bring it under the blood. We need to bring it to the cross. We need to repent. And we need to bring the covering of the blood of Jesus that it could be forgiven and resolved. And then we need to command the curses to be lifted because now they're illegal. And in those the place of those curses, we declare the blessings of God, and we need to uproot the satanic strongholds out of our lives and out of our families' lives. And I know we've all got family members that are struggling. And, you know, the truth be told, we've all got areas in our own lives that we are also struggling. The purpose of the solemn assembly is to provide the forum in which we can get the breakthrough. But the formula is, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. And the most effective way to humble yourself, my friends, is through fasting from food. It just causes you to go down. And all the deception comes out of your out of your mind. You know, when your when your belly's full, your your flesh is full and you're full of your flesh. And that's just the way it works, friends. Now you know, instead of fasting in prayer, God can send trauma your way. You know, I had my little, my little uh, cat Forrest, you know, just overnight got sick and I knew something was wrong and took him to the hospital. And, you know, first I thought, well, he might stay for a day. And then it was, no, maybe he has bladder burst. He might need surgery. And, and I'm thinking, you know, how horrible. And then, no, he had cancer throughout his body. And, and the only compassionate thing would be to put him to sleep. So I held Forrest while he died. You know, and he, and he was he was a beloved little friend. And some people they don't really they're not that close, or they don't love their they don't love animals so much. Other people these are like our kids. You know, I love these little creatures. It's heartbreaking. Watching something die, someone die. A little cat, they have little hearts, little souls. Well, there's a lot of death coming, you guys. You're not going to want to watch your family members die. You're not going to want to watch your children, your parents, your loved ones. And, um, you know, that death, even though Forrest was just a cat, you know, and he was named after Forrest Gump because as a kitten he was very much like Forrest Gump. And, and later in life, he was like Forrest Gump, too. He loved everybody. He would jump in your lap. And yet when he died, my heart broke. And I was just poured out, you know. And so the trauma that comes when your children die, when a pet dies, 
when your loved ones die. This trauma will bring you to the end of yourself, just like fasting and prayer. Fasting is sort of the same process. It's bringing judgment on your own life. So, you know, you can judge yourself, and you can deny yourself, and you can deny your flesh, and you can show up and say, God, I'm serious. Or not. You can go to the potluck. You know, there's plenty of churches that are going to be having the potluck next weekend. We're going to be in solemn assemblies and fasting and praying and weeping and crying out for our sins, and they're going to be having seconds at the potluck table. Okay, suit yourself. Soon enough, they'll want to shoot themselves in what's coming. But you know, you, everybody's got to go their own way now. But for those of you that want to come with Frank and I, we're, go, we're headed to Golgotha Hill. And we're walking the straight and narrow path. And we are headed to the denial of self. We're headed to that valley of dry bones. And we're bringing judgment. We're going to volunteer ourselves. We're going to voluntarily put our flesh down. And you know, when you're fasting, there's going to be those moments of hunger. And they, they come and then they pass, okay? You know, and what I always do is I just tell myself, you know, it's not that I can't eat. You know, and whatever your favorite food is, it's going to come back to you. You're going to want your whatever, you know, your hamburger or your chips and guacamole or whatever your addictions are in terms of the food categories. I just tell myself, I can have that later, just not today. It's not that you never get to eat again, you guys. You're going to get to have your favorite food again. We're not saying you can't eat for the rest of your life. We're just going to deny our flesh for a little window of time in order to seek the Lord with all of our might so that he doesn't have to do the same work in us himself through fire and through trauma, because that's what's coming. See, everybody's got to be cleaned up for the wedding feast. And if you really belong to the Lord, then you're going to be cleaned up, and you get to decide how you want to do it. You can do the work yourself in the comfort of your own home by fasting and prayer, or you can wait, and you can let the Lord do the work in you. And he'll use a blowtorch and an iron brush. And you'll get clean really quick. But you're not going to like the process. It's going to be a lot easier to do the fasting and prayer than the blowtorch and the iron brush, which is what's coming. But either way, it came to pass. It didn't come to stay. And we're getting ready to go to the kingdom. And, you know, I would just encourage you guys, step it up. Quicken your pace because the ground underneath your feet is about to begin burning. And it won't yeah. be long before it's going to get dangerous for us in all nations of the world. Mm. Amen. And, and folks, Benjamin, you know, talked about it, it. Listen, it's easy to have a solemn assembly if you were living you know, in the time of Jehoshaphat, or Jehoiada, or Hezekiah, or Josiah, or Zerubbabel, or Ezra, or Nehemiah, or Joel, or Asa. Those were all times in Samuel, and even during Moses, that there were great solemn assemblies because of the trauma that was going on in Israel back in the day. And it's very easy to do one when everything has fallen apart no one will have to say hey it's time to fast from food okay that that's you won't have to be told that because you will be in such trauma but asa was different now you can look at the end of his life he had some interesting things you know happen but asa during the times of peace he sought the lord so that when the bad times came god already saw that and he mentions it how Asa had done that. And so this is kind of like an Asa experience. We want to seek God before the missiles fly. Before everything falls apart. And truth be told, this is something we should be doing anyways. This is honestly Christianity 101 because this world has fallen apart completely. 
the absolute filth, the 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 uh, abominations, the pride, the you just name it. It is riddled in that which is called the church in modern day America in Europe. And and it, 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 even if this hadn't been happening right now, we should already be doing it just because of the state of what this world is in spiritually. So by doing this now, folks. We're just saying, God, we understand we need to get right with you, and our flesh is the biggest deterrent holding us back from walking in your will. It's simply that and nothing else. And I can't encourage you enough to take a chance on God. Just watch what he will do. He loves and enjoys seeing and blessing his children when they get serious about him. Our Heavenly Father loves the fact, he, when he finds the lost, when they come home, he, gets, he puts them on his shoulders and carries them home. Amen. That's what he does. And that's the same God we are serving right now. Let's do the let's let's do this before it breaks loose. Cuz truthfully it already has. And people can tell you right now they're suffering spiritually like they haven't ever imagined. And the panic and the fear is at an untold level amongst so many people that call themselves believers and, fo- and folks God is not he's never been the author of confusion and fear. No. And that's what's running rampant in the U.S. right now. Don't yeah, and you haven't seen anything yet, Frank. This was just the coming attractions. We've seen nothing. And uh, that Fauci character basically announced uh, today or yesterday, get ready for, for a more radical, tyrannical lockdowns such as you've never yet even seen. But, you know, back to this whole thing of denying the flesh, if you think about God's commandments in the book of Joel, you know, he basically said, gird yourselves and lament, you priest, howl, you ministers of the altar, and lie all night in sackcloth. So, I mean, think about the commandments of God. He's telling the people to sanctify a fast and to lie all night. Now, to sanctify a fast means to set it apart as a time that is holy unto the Lord. You don't fast and watch the Nephilim, the NFL, on TV. You don't sanctify a fast and play satanic music on your radio. You don't sanctify a fast and go do the things that are the pleasures of the flesh. You sanctify the fast by not engaging in the things that feed the flesh and then by setting the time apart for seeking the Lord. But there's three things the flesh wants to do. The flesh, I'll, I'll tell you right now, you, you, tell me if you agree with this. Your flesh wants to eat, it wants to be entertained, and then it wants to sleep. It wants the enjoyment of all the pleasures of the flesh, run the list, it wants all of them, it wants them all the time pretty much, including eating and sleeping. And by sanctifying a fast, we are turning off the pleasures of the flesh. We are turning off the eating. And if you go you know, with a literal take on Joel 1.13, the Lord's talking about an all-night prayer vigil. Another form of breaking the flesh. You deny the food. You deny the entertainment. You deny the sleep. Now, the motivation in the book of Joel is the recognition that days of deep darkness are about to fall upon the land. And this is to prepare ourselves to get right with God that we could walk through a time such as never was. You know, and if that's the witness in you, then approach these days accordingly. We're trying to give you a venue, if you will, place where you can come in agreement in prayer and in agreement in a time of fasting. And I've participated in two solemn assemblies that were done by small groups in person. Everybody fasted for several days before we traveled. 
people traveled from all over the country, and we met in certain cities, and we spent a weekend fasting and praying and repenting together. And on both occasions, the people that attended said it was the most powerful weekend of their lives. Because, as Frank so eloquently explained, when you go all in with God, and you do everything you possibly can do to seek the Lord, the Lord shows up in a big way. When I'm, when I'm in seasons of fasting, and I've been past day three, I go in my prayer closet, and I cry out, and I say, Father, I'm fasting and praying to seek your face this day. And if you don't feed me, I will have nothing to eat. And so I'm asking for the living manna this day. I am asking for the living water this day. And that's all I'm going to have. And if you don't respond, Lord, then I'm, I have nothing. And in those circumstances, our God is a good God. And he definitely responds with the living manna from heaven. And he definitely responds providing the living water, which is the anointing that will break the yoke. And, you know, brothers and sisters, there are yokes that must be broken. The enemy's been waging a nonstop campaign of warfare against us, and most of us have been oblivious. You know, absolutely oblivious. Most of us are not even trained in spiritual warfare. Most Christians don't even know what to do. Well, folks, the war is coming for you. So it would be incumbent upon you to learn how to take the authority that Jesus Christ has given you through his death and resurrection and through the express declarations of his word to his people that he's given you all authority over the power of the devil. It would be incumbent upon you to learn how to walk in and exercise that authority because the days that are coming are going to require it. And, you know, first we've got to eliminate all compromise, all areas of basically where the enemies had some ground on us. We've got to clean all that up. We've got to close all those doors. We've got to repent of all that sin. We've got to get all the incumbent curses that were related thereto, released. And once you've repented of the sin that gave the curse ground, that curse has to move. You command it to be removed. It, ha it has no legal standing. It falls off you like water off a duck. And then you replace it with a blessing. And, and we, we shore up all the chinks in the armor. We cover all the openings in our families and in our homes. And we, and we prepare ourselves for the time that is ahead. And then we learn to walk in the authority of God. And, the, and this is, you know, this is mandatory. Because, folks, the war is coming to you. Now, you might not like the thought that the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and that the violent will take it by force. You might not even like praying with people that use spiritual authority. But you better get used to not only praying with these people, you better get used to walking in the same power. Because it's going to be necessary. When you're in a war, you better learn how to act like a soldier. And, um, you know, we're not going to be showing up and singing Kumbaya and making s'mores around the campfire in the days of darkness that are ahead. And we're going to stand in our faith, and we're going to stand in the authority of Jesus. And we better learn how to do it. And so that's one of the purposes for these times that we could press in and, and learn by example. And, and in these virtual solemn assemblies, we're going to be taking some authority. Now, you know, it's going to be fine for kids to hear this. But, you know, surprisingly to me, sometimes adults get scared. I don't understand it. I mean, anyway, they do, and you know. <laughs> Well, if that's you, then don't show up. <laughs> Maybe you might want to go to the potluck. I don't know. But for those of you who are you know, on the same page and view the ten days of awe as the, I, the perfect window of time to repent and to get everything in the right relationship with God, 
and to do everything in your power to, to return to the Lord with all of your heart, and you're willing to pay the price and show up with us, and let's do this ten days of awe like it should be done. Let's do a time of solemn assembly as powerful as any that has ever occurred on this planet. Let's be the people who stand in the gap for each other. Let's be the people who stand in the gap for, for our families, for our children and our grandchildren. When I went on national tour, Frank, um, I would give the call for fasting and prayer. And, you know, the audience would kind of just not even respond at all. And, you know, and then I, I would raise my hand on that and I would say, you know, are there any mothers in here? Do I have any mothers in the audience? And, you know, a bunch of hands would go up. And I, and I would ask the mothers, you know, do Christian mothers still love their children? You know, if you, maybe you're not willing to fast and pray for yourself. I understand that, you know. You know, we're just, for whatever reason, we're not willing to pay that price for ourselves. What about for your children? Are there any grandmothers here that will fast and pray and stand in the gap for your grandbabies? You know, and, and when you think about it from that context, suddenly it's like, okay, I can do this. It's not that big a deal. You know, we're talking about say, standing in the gap for the salvation and for the safety of our families here. And then I would, after I got done speaking to the moms and the grandmothers, I would, I would again raise my hand and say, are there any fathers? Any fathers who love their families? Are you willing to fast and pray for your wife, for your children, for your grandchildren? Do I, do I have any men in this audience that are willing to stand up and say, yes and amen, I'm going to stand in the gap for the people I love? And, you know, when you put it from that perspective, everybody better show up, right? And so I went around the country starting these little fires in the spirit in every little community I preached in. All these people started fasting and praying. And Well, Frank, you saw part of what happened when that book came out and Amen. People were fasting and praying for you, brother. Fasting and praying for me. We all need to pray for each other because we are in this together. Folks, if you're a born-again Christian, if you're a spirit-filled Christian, if you're part of the remnant, folks, we're all we got. The whole world is going to hate us soon. Well, actually, most of them already do, but you know what I'm saying. This is our opportunity. This is our hour. You know, what are we going to do? This is our testimony for eternity. And we're writing it right now. Who's willing to show up? Amen. Who's willing to pay the price? Amen. Amen. Brother, hey, listen, folks. Don't worry about gathering together with some other people. Don't worry about your social distancing. It doesn't count for families, right? Because if we're in Jesus, we are family. And folks, if you're a part of the remnant call, you are a part of family. And one thing I love is family. I truly love family. And I love hugging people. I love being around people because there's nothing sweeter than being with people who share the same desires and concern. You know, that's, this is what happened. We talked about it last night on the program. What happened back at the Tower of Babel when God split the people? They had to go with whoever spoke their same tongue. And the New Testament says the two cannot walk together lest they agree. And if you're walking with this program, that means we're all speaking the same tongue. We're all speaking that same thing to walk together as family. And hey, sorry, Benjamin. It, my, it dropped me. I had to call in on my phone. Oh. Well, okay, are we still, are we still is, on the air? Yeah, we're still on the air. Don't worry, it's just me. And what I was saying, folks, family, we care for one another. And so, brother, since I called back, had to call back in, um, I'm going to let you sh close the show down. And uh, I'm on my phone, but I still got control through the panel. All right. Well, you know, I thank God that he's been so gracious to warn us to the lateness of the hour. And there should really be no confusion i think it's pretty clear folks you know if it's not maybe go back and you know revisit the events of the last 12 months and perhaps you forgot what's been happening um we are entering in the day of the lord 
that fact is abundantly obvious. If that brother, Pastor Dana Coverstone, if his dreams are legit, and certainly appears them to be so, our lives in this world will be changing radically in the next 30 to 60 days. And this is the window of time to get ready. Let's take advantage of it. Um, you guys, do what you can. In, in Lamentations, the, the, the prophet Jeremiah cried out in chapter 2, verse 19, Arise and cry out in the night. In the beginning of the watches, pour out your heart like water before the face of the Lord. Lift up your hands towards his throne for the life of your young children that faint for hunger that's in every street. You know, we've got trouble coming across the board. You guys know they're destroying the food supply. You know the war's coming. You know a mandatory vaccination of something that would be lethal is coming. The darkness is coming. The day of the Lord is coming. But there is a sanctuary. There's a refuge in the secret hiding place of the Most High God. But you guys, you can't just claim Psalm 91. You have to dwell there in reality. And pretending avails you no benefit whatsoever. we got to get real. And You know, the purpose of the solemn assembly is for us to be able to touch the issues we didn't want to even look at a chance to repent of the sins we didn't even want to own the things we wish we never did the things we wish we never had to talk about the things we'll never want to do again but those are sins that have to be confessed one to another so find someone you love someone you believe you can trust and confess your sins one to another it doesn't have to be to the small group Certainly not to the church. Whoever thought of that model was absurd. Let's follow the scriptures and not the teachings of men. Confess your sins one to another. That times of refreshing would come unto you from the Lord. You know, the Lord blessed the solemn assembly that we had in Sandpoint, Idaho five years ago. A powerful move of the Spirit of God came. The people that showed up who had done the work to prepare their hearts and were fearless in confessing their sins one to another. They walked away forgiven. They walked away full of the anointing. They walked away with the blessings and the favor of Almighty God. You know, and then that door is open to all of us. So, you know, I pray you guys would show up. I pray that you put all of everything you got into this time that we as a, a little remnant community could break through for every one of us and that we would all be found in the remnant and and when we're all together in the wilderness of zion hey grab frank or grab me introduce yourself we'd we'd love to meet all of you in person and and god bless you thank you for tuning in tonight uh we will be back in seven days on the evening of the day of trumpets and we'll begin we will open the 10 days of solemn assembly and i think you know that this is from the lord and so I'm looking forward to it. Um, I'm full of faith, hope, and love that it's going to be awesome. God bless you. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we consecrate this time. We consecrate our lives. We consecrate these ten days of awe to you, Lord, and just to restoring you in, your, the, in the rightful place that you should hold in our hearts, which is first and foremost, and there is no second. So, Lord, I pray you would do a powerful work through your Holy Spirit in the lives of each listener. And, Lord, for people that have never fasted before, I pray you would encourage them, empower them by your Holy Spirit. Be with each of us, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you would open doors for, for people to gather together in small groups during the ten days of awe, and that your Holy Spirit would move powerfully during these uh, virtual solemn assemblies that we're going to be holding on the remnant call, on the night of trumpets, and on the night of Yom Kippur. Lord, we are dedicating this to you. And Lord, we're, we're praying that your perfect will would be done in all of our lives, and that you do a mighty work of, of delivering and restoring your people before your great and awesome day begins. And in Jesus' mighty name I pray, amen. 
Hey. Folks, uh, God bless you um, for being here, Benjamin. Thank you so much. Uh, folks, next Thursday there will be a short remnant call. Just I'll announce, we'll put the link up to uh, the call-in, the Zoom call-in, so you'll be able to dial in over the Internet. You'll be able to dial in um, over uh, your telephone um, so you can be able to hear uh, what's going on, and we'll announce it uh, on Thursday, uh, and we'll also be uh, in giving just more details about the you know, time kicking off on Friday evening and everything. So don't forget, tune in next week, and uh, we will get all that information out. So listen, folks, pray like you've never prayed before. If you don't have a prayer closet, find one. If you don't have a prayer space, make one. Do something. It is time. This is the hour. God bless you. This is Brother Frank and Brother Benjamin on the Remnant Call saying to everybody, good night and shalom.